Welcome to the Friday edition of Juan's World and if you've been watching any of my videos over the past week you'll notice that I'm sliding into Christmas and all of my videos between now and January 6 Epiphany are going to be connected some way or other to Christmas. I looked a little bit at Luke's nativity uh, account last week and I also made a Christmas pudding because last Sunday was stir up Sunday which is the traditional day for making Christmas pudding and next Sunday is the first Sunday in Advent and I'm going to talk today mostly about how to approach Christmas in a way that doesn't make December 25th this big gigantic single focus of Christmas with everything up to that point starting around now the stores start to decorate people start thinking about buying presents and decorating their houses and all of that and they are looking to that one day and they have a big blowout on that one day and maybe if you're British then you'll also have Boxing Day and then there's New Year but there's just that one big blowout day that takes everybody's energy and what I'd like to do is what I call unpacking Christmas that is I'd like to think of it not as one single focal day but as let's say a very tall hill but a tall hill that you can climb slowly and you can start just walking up the hill gently and get higher and higher and higher Christmas Day is at the top of the hill but then you come down the other side and there are plenty of other things on the other side there are festivals that cover the whole Christmas season which begins on the first day of Advent which is this Sunday and which is the first day of the ecclesiastical year and in the church there are a lot of things that we do to move towards Christmas because Advent like Lent is a time when you are preparing for the festival to come and preparing means preparing gently slowly today I'm going to show you how to make an Advent wreath and I'm going to talk about the meaning of the Advent wreath I'm going to talk about the Sundays in Advent how they grow and how the light in the wreath grows over time I'm going to talk about the different festivals such as St. Nicholas uh, Santa Lucia they come before Christmas but after Christmas there's St. John's Day uh, Holy Innocents and all the way down to Epiphany and if you celebrate it like going gently up a hill and up up to the summit and then down the other side then you don't have this cataclysmic boom like oh I've got to do Christmas Christmas boom, 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 boom. and then I know so many people who say oh, I hate Christmas <laughs> and day after I say oh I'm so glad it's over that just seems to me to be taking things very um, cataclysmically <laughs> and it just doesn't suit me I much much prefer to enjoy every moment along the way looking around as I'm climbing that hill seeing all the wonderful things that are happening and then also seeing all the wonderful things going down the other side so it's a complete experience not just you know, one big blowout 
I have some metaphors which I'm thinking of right now and I'm not going to use them. <laughs> but uh, you get the general idea. So let's just start with the Christmas story and then move into some of the things that I do to prepare right now, including making the Advent wreath. Let's get into that. Now, around this time of year, particularly in the United States and also in the UK these days, <laughs> and unfortunately, even in China and Cambodia and Vietnam and everywhere, th that has absolutely no history of celebrating Christmas. Korea does, because Korea has a very large Christian population. But, uh, but China hates <laughs> all religions, and yet they see Christmas as a marketing opportunity, and certainly they do in the United States. And in fact, um, today, um, the day after Thanksgiving is called Black Friday, because it's traditionally the day when retail stores go from red ink, uh, that's in the red, <laughs> to black ink in the black, that it, it, sol solvent, profitable. Because a great many stores, particularly um, small stores, make anything up to 50% or maybe even more of their um, profit in the Christmas season. So they treat Black Friday as their salvation. This year with COVID-19, I don't know. I think a lot of businesses are going to be in difficulty. But the stores are all decorated out. Like some of them, many of them actually start the Christmas decorations before Thanksgiving in the United States. When I used to live in England, we used to start seeing the Christmas decorations right after bonfire night, which is November 5th. So that you, you know, it's two months of all this Christmas stuff. And the stores have not just lights and trees, but they have Santa Claus and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Bing Crosby singing White Christmas. Maybe you've also got Grandma got run over by a reindeer and you've got images of a star and um, shepherds and wise men and camels and everything all just all tumbled all together. But that's not how the stories read in the Gospels. And that's not how the Christmas season is laid out ecclesiastically. Uh, as a simple example, the Magi did not arrive. I mean, let's just leave aside whether or not this is historically accurate or not. But according to the stories, the baby Jesus was born and his star lit up in the sky and the Magi, that is astrologers, saw the star and journeyed and it took them a long time. They didn't arrive that evening. That's why we have Epiphany. Epiphany is the last hurrah of Christmas on January 6th. That is 12 days from Christmas Day. So having the shepherds and the magi all together in the nativity is just, I'm going to say, historically grossly inaccurate. Because 
uh, Luke says the shepherds went and paid their homage and all that, and then they went away. And meanwhile, the Magi, wherever they were, were just looking up at the star and were on their way, and they had to stop in Jerusalem, and, and they, they met with Herod before they went down into Bethlehem. So that means that when I made nativities, and I usually made one at home, I had two nativity sets with all kinds of things to add to the nativity that was, um, you know, it was a craft nativity, but, but I added other animals and I had a little cat <laughs> and an, um, the, a, a crow uh, sitting on the top of the manger, I mean the, the, uh, the shed and so forth. But what I would do is I would start with just the, the shed and the empty manger and animals in it and nothing else. The other participants would be not in the scene at all because we're preparing for all of that. Yeah, Mary and Joseph were traveling from Galilee, so they weren't part of the nativity at that time at all. Just the shed, a manger, cows maybe eating in the manger, and some sheep maybe, and that's it. Then on Christmas Eve, during the day, I would add Mary and Joseph into the nativity scene. And at midnight, I would place the baby Jesus in the manger. And then on Christmas Day, I would add the shepherds into the scene and sometimes I had an angel that I would perch up above it and they would be there for Christmas Day. And somewhere like a long, long way away, I would place the Magi. You know, maybe in the far end of the room on a window ledge or something. And then after Christmas Day, I would take the angel and the shepherds away and just leave Mary and Joseph and the baby. And day by day, I would bring the Magi closer and closer and closer until on Epiphany, I would bring them into the nativity scene. So that gives you a little idea of my concept of the, of the, like climbing the hill and going down the other side. There's something happening all the time and there's something different happening all the time. I also didn't start decorating right away. I would consider about midway through Christmas as being about the right time to start putting up some lights and some decorations, maybe start the tree. Usually around um, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, December 12th. The, um, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception is considered in Argentina to be the beginning of the Christmas season for like, ordinary people. and. Um, they often have um, parades around church. Um, they do all kinds of things, and then they get started. In Argentina, Christmas as a sort of public festivity is not um, particularly noticeable, and materialism certainly is not noticeable. You can't, um, you can't get in the malls <laughs> starting about the 1st of December in the United States. You have to drive around forever to find a parking space. Uh, but in Argentina, people just don't spend a lot of time and energy uh, buying presents. Uh, in the time that I lived there, I got about usually one token thing uh, at midnight on Christmas Eve, and that was it. It wasn't 
it wasn't the big deal. The big deal was the Christmas dinner, which is in in a lot of Catholic countries, certainly in Argentina, you eat on the late on Christmas Eve, sometime you know around ten o'clock you start, and then at midnight everyone bursts open champagne and then and and they let off a huge barrage of fireworks in every barrio. And they it and it goes on for hours and hours and hours. That midnight on Christmas Eve, you know, leading into Christmas Day, is the highlight. And the and the the, the Christmas dinner served at that time is also the great highlight of Christmas, not not the presents. Uh, I was talking to some friends uh, the other day um, who were from the United States, and I was mentioning that. Because of Thanksgiving, and I'm actually recording this on Thanksgiving Day, um, in the United States, the, 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 like the food festival of the winter for people in the United States is Thanksgiving. You know, big turkey and stuffing and squash and green bean casserole and pumpkin pie and all the rest of it. And that's a like huge dinner. And then Christmas, is all about presents. Whereas I, I like to think of Christmas in the Argentine fashion, although I celebrate the day on Christmas Day, not on Christmas Eve, when I'm alone. And it's a, it's a food <laughs> festival for me. Uh, and this year is gonna be really desperate because I don't have, um, my sister sending me presents this year because of the of the virus. She can't send presents. I may get some presents, but I'll probably end up buying my own presents this year. But it doesn't really matter. I'm not interested in presents so much. I am interested in the cooking. And I'm going to show you how to make a Christmas cake uh, on Tuesday. I've already shown you how to make a pudding. I'll show you how to make mince pies. Um, I'll go through cockaliki soup again, maybe. Uh, I'll show you Christmas dinner and all that. I mean, the, the food <laughs> is for me what it's all about. But there are different foods associated with different times leading up to Christmas. And that's really important that each festival has its own foods. But let's just be ecclesiastical again for a minute. now. I understand that a lot of people who have Christian backgrounds don't particularly believe in um, what the church has to say and their Christmas is entirely secular. Doesn't mean that you can't still bring some of the trappings of, of the church into your own celebrations. And that's where I want to get to with the Advent wreath. The Advent wreath is a wreath of candles. It's four candles that progress. There's one on the first day, the, f the first Sunday in Advent, then that one's lit again on the second Sunday, and then a second candle is lit, then a third candle, then a fourth candle, and then there's a Christ candle in the middle, which is lit on Christmas Eve at midnight. And that's an ecclesiastical tradition, and I used to do that at home. I used to have a, an advent wreath, and my wife and I, even before my son was born, would set that on the dining room table, and every Sunday we'd sit down to Sunday dinner, and we'd progress the candles along. The candles represent four different components of the advent season, and the first candle is the candle of hope. I'll talk more about that. Um, probably next week. But the whole idea is you've got this, this wreath with five candles and on the first Sunday, this coming Sunday, you light one candle. So it's just like this glimmer of light in the darkness. And it's called the candle of hope. And that's what Advent begins with, just a hope, a glimmer. You're right at the bottom of that hill, you're moving up, but you're right at the very bottom, 
and you have just one solitary light and then Sunday by Sunday by Sunday it gets brighter and brighter and brighter until until by Christmas Eve it's really festive and joyous and there are also Advent carols when you go to the shops you're going to hear Silent Night and O Come All Ye Faithful and We Three Kings and like all jumbled all together but in the church we start with Advent hymns and the most famous is O Come O Come Emmanuel and that's also just a small opening point just, just, it's not this big bang of uh, O Come All Ye Faithful it's just just a tiny step towards Christmas. So let's move it over to my table and I'll show you how I construct an Advent wreath and I'll explain a little bit more about the symbolism uh, as I construct it. Now here's what you need to make an Advent wreath and of course you can vary some of the components. Uh, this is how I do it now. Um, I have a rather large plate, probably a little bit too big in fact, um, uh, which I bought last year. And I have v violet candles. The ecclesiastical color of the Christmas season is purple or violet. So the candles are violet, but I also have one pink one uh, because the third Sunday in Advent called Gaudete Sunday, the ecclesiastical color changes to pink. So you've got three violet candles, one pink candle, and one white candle, which is the Christ candle. I've also got some sweeties, which I'm going to decorate the platter with. I used to decorate <laughs> with uh, Christmas wreath stuff. And I think it was, yeah, it was two Christmases ago. Um, on, I think, the second, maybe the third Sunday, I, I lit the candles and I went to my desk to work. And I looked up and all of the wreath material was on fire. <laughs> the no fire retardant materials. So I had to put that out and that was the end of my wreath for that year. So this year and last year I made the, uh, the decoration in the platter out of non-flammable candies. <laughs> so I'm going to put it all together now and I'll show you how it works and I'll talk a little bit about the various Sundays. All right, step one is to place the candles on the platter. Now, when I lived in the United States, I actually had a, um, a silver wreath with candle holders. It was so much easier than this. This I have to melt candle wax and then place the candles in the wax and let it harden so they'll stand upright. I'm going to let it harden for a little bit more and then I'm going to decorate. But you can just uh, get an idea that your pink candle is going to be the third one so that you need to start uh, right here with your candle of hope. You go either way, clockwise would be alright. So hope, then peace, joy, love. And let, let them dry and then I'm going to just add a little bit of decorative material. Now, I'm just putting in a little bit right now just to get started, but I go a little crazy over the Christmas season uh, and I keep adding things and adding things. I'll probably add some uh, chocolate coins, you know, the gold covered chocolate coins on um, St. Nicholas Day and who knows what else, whatever I spot I will I will end up placing in here. And here's the completed starter advent wreath. I'm just going to 
leave it until Sunday when I light the first candle and I will take some pictures which I will post on Facebook and I'll also talk a little bit about what it means next week and I know that you're probably subscribed already what I would really like moving into 2021 is to build up my uh, viewership so I really hope that you tell your friends about my videos and please ask them to view them to like and subscribe and I will catch you again on Tuesday with my recipe for Christmas cake.